We've probably all seen an email come through our inbox that seems to be from one sender, but in reality, it's being sent by someone completely different. These types of emails are often categorized as phishing. Phishing is social engineering with just a bit of spoofing. Someone is pretending to be someone else in the hopes that they can convince you to give up your personal information. Sometimes you can check the URL that's associated with a link inside of an email message to see if it's really coming from the domain that you think it should be coming from. There's usually also something a little bit off with the graphics or the spelling, and in some cases, the grammar that's being used in these messages that are trying to convince us that they're really coming from someone we can trust. This is an image of a website that I clicked on when I received a phishing email. You can see it looks very much like the Rackspace Technology webmail login page, although you'll notice the graphics are off just a little bit, but everything else on that page looks as if it could be the legitimate site for Rackspace webmail login. However, if we look at the email where that was sent from, you can see that it does say that it was from Rackspace service, but it came from an email address from iCloud.com. That is certainly not the Rackspace domain name, and that's not the person we would expect to be sending us information about Rackspace email. You also notice the text in this email has different fonts associated with it. And the first line of this message says, Dear user, we notice your email has not been confirmed for the new upgraded service. There's no period at the end or no other type of punctuation. This should certainly cause us to look more deeply into the details of this message. And at the very least, we should never click a link inside of an email message. I was able to click this link and provide you with these screenshots by using a virtual machine that was completely isolated from all of my other systems. In this particular case, that was the image that came up when you click that link. So on the top is the image from the phishing email, and on the bottom is the legitimate Rackspace email landing page. You can see that they are very similar to each other, but there are some significant differences that you can make out now that we have them side by side. But if you weren't familiar with the Rackspace login page, the phishing email is close enough that it probably could fool quite a few people. This is the goal of the attacker. They want to make this page look so similar that you will be enticed to put in your email address and your password. And at that point, when you click the login button, you're actually sending those credentials directly to the attacker. Another useful social engineering technique used by the attackers is shoulder surfing. We use our mobile devices and our laptops in public all the time. We could be in an airport, a restaurant, a coffee shop, and anyone who can look over our shoulder could potentially see the information that's on our screen. Part of the problem with this, of course, is that occasionally we will be reading through information on our screen that could be considered sensitive. And in some cases, it might be information that our competition would love to have. Someone standing behind you or sitting at a table that's behind you has full access to view the information that's on your screen. And there have been situations where people have been able to read the screen of a computer that's in another building. They would use binoculars or a telescope to be able to view the information that's on your screen, even though they're in a completely different location. One of the more advanced versions of this are attackers that will put malware on your computer to enable your camera and be able to see exactly what you're doing when you're sitting at your computer. We can use a number of different techniques to try to prevent shoulder surfing. One is to make sure that we understand where we happen to be. If you're in a coffee shop, maybe your back should be towards a wall. If you're in a public area, it might not be the best time to start scrolling through information about payroll or social security numbers. You can also get privacy filters for your LCD screen that can only display the information on the screen if you are sitting directly in front of that device. Anyone who's to the side of the device simply sees a black screen. These work exceptionally well. You could be on a plane right next to somebody in coach, and if they have a privacy filter, all you see is a black screen. And if your computer is near a window, you might want to turn your computer so that the monitor faces away from that window. Not only will this help with the glare that's coming in through that window, it would prevent anyone from being able to see what's on your screen by looking through that window. You should always keep in mind the information that you happen to be viewing on the screen and where you might be at any particular time so that you're not disclosing any sensitive information to any third party. 
A lot of the security for a physical location happens at the front door. If you can get through that initial door, a lot more information will be available to you. And the attackers know this. They found ways to get into buildings without having any type of authorization. One technique that attackers use to get into a building is tailgating. Tailgating is using someone who's authorized to give you a way into the building. Maybe when somebody is walking in, they'll hit the badge, unlock the door, walk through the door, and leave the door to close on its own. While they're walking away, you can walk up and stop the door from locking again and simply walk into the building. That's a perfect example of tailgating. Another technique that's very similar is piggybacking. With piggybacking, you have someone who is authorized to get into the building, and they're letting you in the building as well with their knowledge. This can be easily accomplished by bringing in lunch or carrying in boxes of donuts and asking the person who's opening the door to hold the door so you can make it up to the conference room. They can see that you're walking in. They're even helping you get into the door. And in that particular case, we call that piggybacking. And as many attackers will tell you, once you're in that front door, it's very easy to walk around the inside of that building where many of those doors are already open. To prevent tailgating and piggybacking, we should always be looking to see if someone is in this building who should not be there. Most organizations will provide visitors with a visitor badge that clearly shows that they are in the building as a visitor and they are authorized to be there. But if someone's walking around without a badge, it should be your responsibility to ask them where their badge happens to be. And if they don't have a good answer, it's time to call security. Some organizations also have very strict rules on badging in and having one person walk in at a time. There might even be people lined up at the door, but one person will badge in, walk through the door, and physically close the door so that the second person can then badge in. Following that process would probably prevent any type of unauthorized access. You could also use an access control vestibule or an airlock that would only allow one person in the building at a time. This effectively takes the policy of one person scanning at a time and turns it into a mechanical requirement where only one person can walk in at a time. And although it may be uncomfortable to walk up to a stranger and ask them where their badge happens to be, this is something that has happened to me many times inside of a building where I've had a badge on a jacket, I've taken the jacket off, and then I've gone to get coffee at the coffee maker. And very often, people from that company will walk up to me and say, hi, I don't recognize you. Do you have a visitor badge or can you tell me who you're with? These are organizations that have worked hard to train their employees to look for things that may be out of the ordinary and to address those so they don't become a larger security issue. If you look in the back of your building, I'll bet in the parking lot, there is a garbage bin. Sometimes we refer to this as a dumpster, although that is a brand name of a particular unit. In the other parts of the world, these have different names, such as a rubbish skip. Going through your trash is a very useful social engineering technique that attackers use all the time. It's remarkable how much sensitive information is simply being thrown into the garbage without any type of security associated with it. These garbage bins and dumpsters are often open and unlocked. Very often you can find names that can then be used for impersonation or phishing over the phone. And there may even be contact information that can help with additional phishing attempts. Attackers often try to find the right time to go through the garbage. It may be at the end of a quarter or the end of a big project where a lot of information may be thrown out. And a lot of those details in the garbage may be perfect to use for a future attack. There is a question about legality of going through someone else's garbage. In the United States, the garbage is effectively free to go through as long as it's something that has already been thrown out by the original owner. This is not always the case, and there may be local or state regulations that would prevent someone from going through someone else's garbage. But if there are no local laws, everything in that garbage bin may be available for anyone to stop by and take. But if the bin is on private property and there are signs that say no trespassing or no visitors allowed, then you certainly would not be able to access that trash at that location. If you're trying to understand more about whether going through this garbage may be legal in your area, then I would recommend you contact a legal professional and see what the options might be in your particular geography. 
To prevent someone from going through the garbage, one of the best things you can do is to lock it up. You can put a fence around that area, you can put monitoring cameras, and you can prevent anyone from gaining physical access to your trash. You can also shred the information that you feel might be sensitive. Some organizations will have a third-party shredding service come through every month, and they'll sit in the parking lot and shred all of your sensitive information. Some organizations go one step further. It's not unusual for governments to light all of their sensitive information on fire because once you burn it, there's no way anyone can gain access to that information. If you're wondering if this is something you should be worried about, then maybe you should look through your own garbage. There might be information in there that is relatively sensitive, and you may need to institute new policies to prevent someone from walking by and simply grabbing your sensitive data right out of the trash.